nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Welcome back uh, to this uh, to this class, and this is the third lecture. Now we are having a very interesting discussion uh, in the in the classroom itself. And the question was related to the previous, uh, previous uh, lectures. And the important thing was that the population variance or standard deviation versus sample one. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, as an answer that if you have a relatively large sample, which is let's say uh, a thousand uh, element data, that's almost like a population, no distinction between a population and a sample. And in that case, the, you don't have to subtract the minus one, uh, one or minus two that you don't generally see. But when you have, let's say, just three pieces of information, let's say you have just three data points in a sample. In that case, uh, you can get average of the three, fine. You can get standard deviation. Uh, you can get the second moment. But obviously, you cannot get the third or fourth moment because we, from a three piece of information, you can just create three piece of uh, matrix. If you try to go forward, it's, it, uh, you're trying to get more than what you had in the original sample, and that would not work. So this degree of freedom, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, takes into account of that one. All right. So let's get started in the today's lecture. Uh, my uh, goal today is to explain physical and empirical distributions. And uh, just to quickly summarize what we have done this uh, first week, uh, is the, in the first week, I, the first class, I explained the importance of big and small data uh, and where they come from. Uh, in the second class, my goal really was to say that treat the data with respect and don't try to fit the data uh, immediately. The first thing to do would be to, um, to look at the data in terms of median, in terms of uh, interquartile range, and uh, throw away any data don't throw away, I mean, sort of not consider any data that are beyond that uh, range, 1.5 uh, interquartile range, beyond that range. Uh, keep the data, but don't consider it into subsequent analysis. Now, in the last class, we really did most of the things in terms of discrete uh, things. For example, we did leaf, stem and leaf histogram. Uh, that was discrete. Uh, we did cumulative distribution function. That was discrete because none of the data was sort of fitted or corrupted in any way. And this is very important to uh, keep the data as is and then analyze as much as possible. Now, before I start in today's, uh, today's lecture, I just want to have two housekeeping things. One is that uh, uh, your uh, every class uh, there is a Google form that you can, if you go to the blackboard, you will see that there is a link for the Google Google form. And in the Google form, what I'm asking you to say that what concepts you did not understand, uh, because sometimes I may not be able to get to those questions immediately, uh, or um, um, what transitions did you find difficult so that I can improve next time. I mean, I'm learning as much as you are. Uh, so I'll appreciate the input. The second is that I will also post the homeworks uh, as a Google form where you can pick the answers from a list. That way I don't have to grade it uh, one by one and you will immediately see whether your responses were correct or not. Right. So this is the, these are the two things. Keep an eye on the blackboard and generally you will have a week uh, or so to respond to this, but do it as soon as possible. So today, uh, let me get started on this discussion today. So uh, I will talk about four things today, physical versus empirical distribution. The word empirical means experimental. Uh, the physical means that the distribution that comes out of physics, uh, not necessary, and I will distinguish these two important, uh, two important concepts. Now, there will be a set of empirical distributions, sort of, uh, that we are, we know. For example, normal distribution, wavebull distribution that are widely used. I will introduce uh, them uh, to you. Uh, but the third part is where things get really interesting, is that now you have the data from the last two class, classes, and now you have some distribution. Let's say you want to uh, 
connect the two. You want to say the data that you saw in the last class is actually normally distributed. Uh, how would you do that? And if you do that, then what are the pitfalls? So that will be the goal today, uh, goal of the lectures today. So the, the, on the left hand column, uh, or, uh, that what you see is that the data itself, this is input and you have to sort of um, clean the input, analyze the input and the, without really converting it uh, and asking any question of the data yet. First, you make the data as clean as possible, plot the data properly. If the data uh, doesn't have uh, certain values which are perfect, then you ac account for it by Kaplan-Meier formula, for example, I showed it last time. And then, once you have the data ready, then you begin to do hypothesis testing. That maybe this is a Gaussian distributed, maybe it's variable distributed. Those questions you begin to ask. Now, the point I want to make, and this is often something you may or may not have realized in, in, in your, uh, for what you learned in high school before, is that there are a class of distribution like normal distribution and Gaussian distribution or Poisson distribution, which you saw, see in that, in that blue box over there. This is something you know of. But it turns out that those are uh, derived in a time when computer didn't exist and people could only do a few analytical, few simple things. You know how the coin flipping works. The coin flipping essentially gives you a normal distribution because you flip many coins, so you say how many head and how many tails, uh, you get that. And generally when you are uh, younger, then they teach you those things. But those were sort of really not purely statistical because flip of a coin doesn't depend on um, uh, on the air resistance or anything. It's a hypothetical thing. Uh, it doesn't matter how high you f flip the coin because there is also a physics underneath, but we disregard the physics and we just make a idealized distribution. It's widely used. But it turns out that the number of distributions in the world is huge, much bigger than uh, this, the small things that you learn in your uh, undergraduate statistics class. For example, Fermi distribution, you all know in the semiconductor devices, if you have seen that Fermi distribution, Bosch Einstein distribution, those are equally good distribution. But in statistics class, you'll never hear about uh, the, those distributions generally. But those are also derived from physics. So the distribution that are derived from physics, we'll call it physical distribution. The distribution that you see, it's purely because you have done some experiment, you see the data arranged in a particular way, we'll call them empirical distribution. Now, there are, of course, many other types of distributions. Uh, for example, the, when the Saturn probe uh, was uh, sent, a probe meaning that it was a small uh, spacecraft was sent, the way it was fluttering uh, as it was approaching Saturn, that really didn't have any known distribution to describe it. It was not Gaussian distribution, it was not any of those distributions. So point is that uh, the number of distributions that we have, the space of distributions is actually much larger than what we generally typically learn in the class. And if you do a wrong distribution, choose a wrong distribution, your uh, predictions would be completely wrong. And if it's completely wrong, we will give you an example, then you can be in big trouble. So before we get there, let's get started. Um, uh, by the way, there is also, I, I write something as a, call a fish in a river uh, uh, distribution. And I will explain what that one is. This is a very strange distribution. We always think that a distribution has an average. It turns out this distribution doesn't have any average. So I will explain that this is we just learn a subclass of problems in our traditional classes. So let me begin by explaining uh, some of the well-known distributions just to get started. Now normal distribution um, uh, is, uh, is something that is very well known and broadly used and often for electrical engineering and for any many engineering functions is actually is not a very good distribution to use. People use it because it's easy. Uh, and in fact, very seldom things are normal. Uh, so therefore, it is something we have to sort of think about it carefully. 
log normal distribution is like a normal distribution but where the variable x instead of the vari input variable x we take the input variable as log of x and log normal distribution is very important for example in the back end of a transistor in integrated circuit you will often see that uh, the failure distribution is given by a log normal not a normal distribution and there is a physical reason for that i will not explain it today and wavebull distribution is another one that is also widely used uh, and it is called an extreme value uh, distribution any time you have a gate dielectric breakdown uh, or if you have a bunch of aircraft and you want to know how what is the failure distribution of the wings how after what long how long a time you have to replace the wings or the tires in the space aircraft it, these are often given by the wavebull distribution in fact wavebull distribution was discovered in that context in the 1949 to there is a paper uh, that explained that all right so these distributions are often called a two parameter family two parameters why because there are two parameters that describes this distribution uh, one is of course the average uh, we learned about the average right uh, in the um, let me take this laser pointer and then highlight it so you know that this is the average and this is the standard deviation now why am i using as a average and standard deviation rather than median and interquartile range the reason is of course this is a continuous distribution when you have many 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 samples then uh, you can use this distribution hence you use it uh, over there uh, similarly this is your distribution function so which is given by different values of mean and different standard deviation that you know and if you wanted to do the cumulative distribution function you will integrate it and when you integrate it it will go from 0 to 1 depending on where your mean is wherever the mean is and then it will symmetrically go between 0 and 1. Now of course this is one type of distribution this is not need not be the only type of distribution. Uh, by the way many of these two parameter family two parameter has many distributions binomial is one binomial distribution you may have there's a coin flip one. Uh, you may have Poisson distribution or you have chi-square distribution, the student distribution. So there are a wide variety of um, uh, distribution functions that depends on you have to get two parameters to describe them. Now another uh, two parameter distribution function is called log normal. And in the log normal, the only thing that you see previously we had t minus mu. And only thing is that now the variable is log t and the other variable is log mu and so you have the same mu you calculate it exactly the same way but now you take the and that's why the word log log is in front of the normal so it's a normal distribution same square you see up here except the variable has been transformed from uh, log uh, log uh, from t to log t and likewise you can do the integration and you can find out the corresponding function so there are I will explain this so this is one is the uh, the probability distribution function the another one is cumulative probability distribution just integrating up um, and then there are two other things that I'm going to explain to you in a table very soon uh, this is the uh, sort of failure rate so I, I'll explain that I'll explain that in a second. The most important in the reliability physics, the most important distribution that people talk about and it's widely used uh, in variety of things. Anytime uh, you may have uh, in the, in, when you were an undergraduate student, if you did a crystallization experiment where you put a, uh, a salt crystal and gradually the crystal grows, it turns out that that's given by the wavebull distribution also. And in fact, uh, although his name is Abrami, uh, he first described the distribution in the context of crystal growth and then later on all the failure distribution turned out to have the same physics. So you can derive it physically. Uh, it's not a random thing, it's just something that you can derive. And once again, why are you calling it two parameter? Do you see where the two parameters are? You will see that there is one parameter here, alpha. Other parameter here is beta. And so you have alpha and beta. So those are the two unknowns that you'll have to describe. Once you have the data, you'll be able to uh, get the alpha and beta 
uh, that way. Uh, and uh, this is the probability distribution and this is the cumulative probability distribution and um, I am going to explain uh, this, this uh, parameter in a second. And the remarkable thing about this distribution is that when under certain conditions this can really represent a variety of other functions like Bernoulli functions. Uh, and relief functions and exponential functions just by changing beta you can go from one to another. So, this is really not variable is not really one. It is really a super class of many many functions. That is why people have tabulated their values and all these days you do not have to do any of those. You can just go in MATLAB or Ulfam Alpha and they will tell you, but you have to know the physics that why are they coming from. So, Rayleigh distribution is with light scattering. When you have a small particle, light is coming in, the distribution you want to do, that's, that's given by the, the Rayleigh, Rayleigh distribution. So, this is where uh, it gets interesting. So, for example, let's say you are a mathematician, you do not like data. You just sit in your office very carefully, do integrals and differentiations. And of course, that in that case, you will have a distribution for normal, you will have a distribution for log normal, uh, or you can have a mathematical description of the, you remember the beta and alpha, right? And the two parameters and all. By the way, there are of course, three parameter distribution, four parameter distribution function. I am just giving you one example, one set of example. Uh, three parameters, anytime you do ion implantation uh, in, a, in a semiconductor. Generally, you will have three parameter Pearson's distribution. So, different people have done different type of distribution over the years. Now, once you have done this, you can take the moment. By moment, simply it means that multiply with t and then um, integrate it over. So, that gives you the moment and the first moment is mu. Of course, the average, if you say normal distribution, when you have the average, the average, the mu, that would be the also the first moment. What is the second moment? Second moment is you multiply with t squared the probability is here, and then integrate it over. If you do that, then uh, if once you use uh, all the complicated maths are done and all, you will get sigma squared as you might you might have expected that that is where these things come from. But that is not true for other two distribution. Life would be a little bit more complicated for the other two. Your first moment would be mu times e to the power sigma squared divided by 2. And so, you can immediately see that if you want to get mu, by the way, I am talking about this mu. And if you wanted to get um, sigma, which is that sigma, then you cannot just solve one equation and equate it. You have to set one value for the first moment and for the second value, second moment, two equations, two unknowns, and then that will give you the two solutions, right? And uh, Therefore, and if you want to do Weibull, Weibull the two parameters alpha and beta, again equate it to the first moment and equate to the second moment and then you get the corresponding value of alpha and beta. You can immediately see why people do not like this type of thing because now you will have to do an extra work, it is not immediately mu and sigma you get in one shot. So, therefore, it is a little bit complicated. All right. So, it turns out that the probability distribution um, um, has a people express it in various forms. These are all equivalent forms. You can have probability, two parameter alpha and beta or mu and sigma, this could be one. The cumulative probability is the integral of this probability. Survival functions is that how many have failed and how many have remained. So, if there are 100 uh, parts of something, 84 have failed, so then your uh, R is 16, the 16 are still surviving. And, um, and then hazard rate, hazard rate says of the ones that are still surviving, what is the probability that they will fail in the next instant? You know, I am almost 55 years old. So, what is the probability that I will die this year? So, that is the hazard, my hazard rate because 1 over Ft is the fraction that has survived of the people up to 55 and Ft is the failure rate, instantaneous failure rate in that time. So, that is hazard rate is a very important thing. Can you think about for which industry hazard rate would be very important? 
which industry would it be? Life insurance. Life insurance, of course. Life insurance would be very important because they need to know that what they charge for your premium uh, based on if you are very young, then you, they will have your FT is very small uh, and 1 over FT is very large. But you can see that as uh, you are getting older, FT will rise quite a bit uh, and then 1 over FT is becoming smaller. That's why your insurance thing goes up. Another one is cumulative hazard, hazard rate and which is simply if you have the hazard rate, you just integrate between 0 to T. Uh, it's like you're going from here to Indianapolis, uh, every mile you have a hazard of uh, getting an into an accident and what is the integrated hazard uh, over the period of time. Uh, average hazard is of course you average it over time and so on and so forth. But the important thing is that if you know one, if you know one, you know all other. That's the point and you'll see in different places people uh, plot it in different ways. Now, one important thing I want to mention that although when we are thinking about uh, mathematical like a normal distribution or variable distribution, you can do it mathematically, meaning that you can uh, just take a derivative. We all know how to take a derivative. If you have forgotten, again, Ulfam Alpha can help you to take a derivative. But, but the thing is that when you have data, data, how do you take a derivative or how do you do integration of a derivative? Then the idea is the same. Remember, this was the cumulative derivative. And you, you probably remember, right? Uh, wh what was this formula called, sort of, do you remember? It goes with the hazard, sort of as a similar to, huh? what is this formula called, do you remember? It's called a Hazen formula. Yeah. Hazen formula, right? So, Hazen formula tells you the cumulative distribution. So, let's say you don't want your cumulative distribution, you want probability distribution. So, how would you do that? So, how you would do that is take a derivative that I know, but now you take a discrete derivative. And when you take a discrete derivative, the corresponding formula is this, because you can just put this one in here and then take a derivative and then you'll get, uh, you, you have to take i plus 1 and then i and then simplify it, then you can get discrete derivative. You can get a discrete derivative for the, um, for the hazard rate also, this uh, lambda i, right? So, you can, you can calculate that. This would be one thing that you may want to check when you have a spare, uh, spare moment. So, this is a table uh, that sort of connects everything to everything. So, for example, so for example, let's say somebody has given you the, um, the integrated hazard rate H and then they tell you give me the probability distribution function. So, then you will go in this table. And then you'll say, okay, what I have to do is to put e to the power h over t and take a derivative of dh t dt and whatever comes out of that, that's really f of t. So, any point in that box, to sort of you can see that in the diagonal, of course, if you are given the survival function and you are also expected to give the survival function, you don't have to work at all. You can just uh, put the same thing back in here, you are done. So, diagonals are very similar, say simple, but off diagonals, for example, in here, how to get it FT or if you want to have, if you know FT and you want to get average hazard, hazard rate, then you put that FT in here, integrate, take a log and that gives you the hazard rate. Right? You see, this is a table, uh, you can easily derive it. Um, uh, I can, if you like, I can give you a homework just so that to make sure that you actually derive it. All right. So, what do we have now up to, up to this far? Up to this far, on one hand, we have a bunch of data. We have a bunch of data that we have massaged very cleanly, thrown away the outliers. We have done the Hazen formula or Kaplan-Meier formula, taken care of the data itself. No distribution has been assumed. Now we have these distributions and we want to see does the data fit into any of these distributions. So, at this point what people do and numerous papers uh, in the journal uh, people would do this. What they would do, let us say you have let us say 60 oxides, oxides uh, you are doing an experiment, let us say you are employed by Intel or somebody and you have 60 experiments, you are a scientist uh, in the, their characterization group 
and you have testing the 60 and you have recorded in the first thousand hours there are first the seven failures seven failures and so therefore how many did not fail 53 did not fail but seven have failed and how long after how long and some of them have failed after 181 hours some have failed after the last one has failed 805 hours and remember I have stopped taking the measurement after thousand hours so I don't have anything else I may have more at 1300 hours 1500 hours of course every, everything is going to fail so how did I calculate the cumulative distribution this fi how did I do that well remember that this is let's say uh, this this row how did I get this row so what should I put the, the value of i I should be I should be 4 and what should I put for the value of n how many samples do I have 60 so the denominator would be 60.4 and the numerator would be how much 4 3. 3.7 3.7 divided by 60.4 not not clear Hmm? Okay. So, so you can see that's why the number is very small if it were just seven just seven then by this time it would have been one but uh, I sort of I, I have only taken the part of the total failure distribution and so on so forth. so this is one thing um, and uh, sometimes you can just uh, take this data and what you can do do you see I have plotted these are the rate points are the value of fi that I have plotted. So for example, the first point for the first point is 0 0.012. Remember, I have ordered these numbers. The first one is 0 0.012. So this would be the first point. And then the next point would be 0 0.028 and so on and so forth. So you correspond and the x points 181, 299, those are along this axis. And obviously, it has uh, the maximum is about 0 0.111, and you can see the last point is something like 0 0.11. Red star, the red star. So, they, how many red stars do I have? I have seven red stars. Of course, I have 60 red stars, but those are not within this. Thing. Then you can do. A, you can ask uh, MATLAB or Wolfram Alpha uh, to essentially fit the data. And if you fit the data, then what it will do is that it will try to assume. And then here was what I have gotten. After fitting it, I have uh, I have gotten that if it is distributed by uh, given by the variable distribution, then um, the value of a or a, I should say alpha in this case is two nine nine zero. Does it make any sense to you? To, what is two nine nine zero? That is the average time of failure is three thousand hours based on seven data points uh, actually this data would have gone like that and then it would have gone and then saturated to one and so obviously uh, the mean time or average time would be much larger than uh, thousand hours so after fitting you get something like this so three thousand hours uh, you can say that this would this would be fall and then correspondingly you can get the other parameter beta uh, the beta in this case is 1.56 if you ask it to fit it by Webull, uh, the computer is very happy uh, uh, that to go and fit it by Webull uh, or log normal. And it will return you the values, the mu, it will return you as 8.19 and uh, standard deviation is going to return to you as 1.3. No problem. You gave it your data, computer returns you the fitted distribution. Now, both of them look beautiful. At this point, right? The green card looks beautiful and the red card looks beautiful. So you can, if you like, you can use either one of them as if. What is the problem? The problem is your physics understanding is zero. You're just trying to do statistics. And when you try to do statistics purely, everything can, many things can look very good. But actually, it may be completely wrong. Completely wrong. Without physics, it can be completely wrong. Is that clear? Fitting is clear, right? So you just take those values and then call a MATLAB function. It will fit it and it will get the mu and sigma or alpha and beta 
just like what I showed you in the moments, and then that, that will do it. So this is the danger. You see, in this case, what happened was that I was just looking at the data of failure from 180 to 805, more or less linear, linear uh, in, in this axis. I should have uh, done it a little bit more carefully, but uh, this axis is essentially linear. So therefore, you cannot really distinguish it. On the other hand, if you really do it in the log and extrapolate, then you can see the danger. Because remember, what was our first failure time? About um, 181, right? little bit more than 100 and this was little bit less than 1000. So in this curve, where am I looking at? Between here and over there. So my seven data points are over there. But, and they looked very good over there because I fitted them over there. But now, remember, why am I testing those devices? Because I want to sell probably 10 million phones. And so I have to use that sample to extrapolate to population. That what is the probability that the first time out of the 10 million, the customer is going to give, bring back the phone and I'm going to have a PR crisis, public relationship crisis, right? And you can see that it matters is significantly that if, um, uh, if you assume log now variable distribution, the first customer will come back much, much, much earlier, within probably a couple of hours of after you have, uh, because this is 10 to the power minus 2 hours. Compared to, compared to if you assume a log normal distribution, they will come back much later. So therefore, you can see that the physics free fitting is a very, statistics without physics is a very dangerous game to play. That's why this whole course is about all about really understanding statistics in a way so that uh, you can uh, use them uh, very effectively. Uh, this is one reason uh, often people use different type of normal distribution would be even more dangerous log normal is a little bit better, but Weibull is generally the most pessimistic of the distributions. And uh, that's why uh, one has to be very careful what distribution to choose. And in the next week, I'll spend some time that even when you don't know the physics, even then how to choose properly. Because even uh, within the range we fitted, where it looked good, if you looked carefully, you would have seen the telltale sign of something being wrong. Because you cannot really, I mean, sometimes physics, you may not know the physics. Let me explain to you another distribution that you have never seen, maybe. And uh, that is very strange because we always sort of know, we have think about that distribution always have an average. That's what we have always heard, right? But it turns out that there are wide class of distributions which doesn't have an average. And that is precisely how uh, Amazon has gotten so rich because Amazon's distribution does not have a, uh, I'll explain that in a minute, does not have an average. On the other hand, Walmart's distribution, physical stores distribution has an average. So I'll exp first explain this model and then I will explain the connection uh, with the marketplace that how, uh, how Amazon got so interesting. So this is a model. And I worked out this model a couple of years ago without knowing uh, the, that whether it applies to anything or not. And this is the general idea. Assume you have a river. It's a one-dimensional river. And this R stands for the river. And then the river terminates at a waterfall. And the waterfall is the W. So it is terminated by a waterfall. And on the other side of the river, you have a mountain. Uh, so it's a region where the uh, sort of get reflected uh, in some way. So if you push some, let's say in this point, you'd push some fish in the, in the, and the fish is blind. So it's like a, uh, it goes in the, 
random direction. It doesn't know which was forward and which and every time constant, every time interval it jumps to the left or it jumps to the right. Okay. Now obviously if there's a mountain it cannot really go all the way uh, and then it will get, when it comes here it will be scattered back and then it will go in here. So you can eventually see that eventually all fish will drop here and then they will disappear from my system. Now, if I didn't have the waterfall, of course, uh, it would have go keep going on this side, come back on this side, and gradually I would have, and if I didn't have this, uh, I would have a normal distribution around this over time. It's possible. But that's not really the interesting problem. The interesting problem that when you have a failure, failure is like a waterfall, that it drops and disappears from your system. So that's like in waterfall. So this is a much better representation of when you have a reliability problem. If something fails. That's not uh, without the waterfall that wouldn't have happened. It turns out that this is a, not a complicated math problem to solve. It's a diffusion problem and uh, at the end of the day you can write the solution of the diffusion equation and I will not be at that point. You can just uh, put the solution, uh, put it in here to con uh, show that actually the solution is correct. Now, of course, the total number of fish that you have, the sum must follow this relationship. Why? Because this says how many do you have between the 0 is the mountain or uh, 0 and L is a, L is the mountain, 0 is in here, let's say. So this says the fish that are still in the river. And this one, f of tau d tau is saying, how many fish has disappeared at every time t, right? And you integrate over up to time t. So that many fish are dead, integration of that, and this many fish are still jumping around. And if you put this f of p of t in, in, in this equation, uh, integrate it, and then do a differentiation with respect to time, at the end of the day, you are going to get a distribution function like this. It sort of looks like a, um, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Almost, almost like a Weibull type distribution. You can see that there are parameters like x naught squared, which is like alpha, and then there you have an x naught. There is also another coefficient d. So the d is saying the rate at which the fish jumps forward and backward, uh, and that gives you it's a two-parameter distribution, and that gives you an FT. But this is a very strange distribution because let's say you don't know physics. You don't know those differential equations. You have a computer and in the computer you are throwing num certain number of fish and you are looking at how many fish sort of arrives on the other end, right? You can write a little, more, a little MATLAB code and then see how it happens. And uh, let's say you push a certain number and the data comes out like that. So this is a certain number of fish coming out as a function of time. Do you see, in the beginning, uh, it takes a certain amount of time to get started because if you are injecting here, then it will take a certain number of hops before it can come here. So therefore, it cannot start from zero, it will start from here. And then uh, as they keep coming, you are using a delta function here putting 1,000 fish at the same time and you are looking at how they come out, they like an impulse response. So then there will be a certain number which will come out very quickly and then they will fall. Then you can try to fit, then you do, let's say, instead of 1,000 fish, you said, okay, I want to get the average properly. So I will put 10,000 fish or I will put 50,000 fish. And this is the arrival time distribution. Now, if you ask how long does it take for the fish to arrive on average, it turns out that there is no mean in this one. Do you see why? The reason is, oh, how do we get an average? Do you remember a few minutes ago I said moment, how to get a moment? You have to multiply with t and integrate over 0 to t because this is a probability distribution and then you integrate. Do you see the problem with this integration? This is, what is it? It is 3 over 2 and you have a t on the top and so therefore when you integrate it, you don't have any average. The average will diverge. 
And so, therefore, this distribution is not central value limit theorems and all those things, none of these things would apply. So, the connection, this is just, you don't have to remember the physics, just uh, I, what I want to say that apart from normal, log normal, weighable, uh, these things that you may or may not have heard before, there are a broad range of uh, distribution functions that are often needed in the modern, uh, modern analysis, which does not satisfy even the basic requirements of a standard distribution function. So, what is the connection with respect to Amazon? You see, one thing Amazon can do because it doesn't have a physical, uh, physical store is that they can keep one copy of a book or a two copy of a book. And these things always have a long tail. Long tail means that few people may be interested in certain number of books. Most people are interested in this bestsellers. But you can keep this distribution for a, as many as you need. You can keep two copies of a book and you can sell it for a profit. When you sum, it turns out that there is no limit to the profit. Profit will keep growing depending on how long your tail is. On the other hand, physical stores like Walmart, they must cut it off at some point because they have a finite space. They cannot keep two copies of a book if there's not enough customer. And if you do that, then there is a limit to that profit. So hence, distribution functions are very important and that is the heart of many of these um, uh, modern uh, stores. Like, uh, you know, in a movie theater, you can only show so many movies. But in a Netflix, even if one person wants to see one movie in 10 years, it doesn't matter. You click on it, you get $5. They get $5 or whatever they get, I don't know. So you get the basic idea, right? So let me wrap up uh, today's discussion about what I tried to say. Uh, is that first is that you take care of the data. Uh, you take care of the data uh, in a clean way. Second, uh, what you do is that many times you will have to fit it with a distribution. Uh, your advisor may say that, uh, you know, people think that this is a normal distribution or log normal, or you may have a bias and you may be able to fit it with one or other distribution. But what I'm trying to warn you is that anytime you try to fit, either if you don't have physics or deeper statistics than what people have, you will often fit it wrong. And if you fit it wrong, your extrapolation will be completely wrong. And that's the dangerous part of it. Especially the problems that involve extreme value problem. Reliability is an extreme value problem. Fish in a river is an extreme value problem. By extreme value problem, it means that there is a process which is abruptly terminated. You know, just somebody is alive and then somebody is dead. That's, ab that's extreme value problem. So, if you have an extreme value problem, the distributions are often very sensitive, uh, especially the tail of the distribution uh, has a long tail. And there you have to be particularly careful. And I finally, I said this moment-based method of curve fitting, uh, people often fit curves, uh, but I think this is uh, often have to be a very, um, because, you know, engineers often don't learn about statistics very cleanly. So, they just fit. But when you fit, let's say you fitted, you did a simulation of 10 uh, SRAM transistors and it has some threshold voltage fluctuation, random open fluctuation, for example. Then you say, okay, I'm going to extrapolate it to what's going to happen to a billion transistor. Because you did uh, device simulation is expensive, you could only then 10 or maybe 20. And then you fit it with normal. And then you said that, okay, for 10, if this is the variation, for a billion, that would be the variation. And then you say, okay, my circuit should be designed this way. Chances are your circuit will not be designed that way because random open fluctuation is not a normal phenomenon, a normal distribution. So your things would be tail would be wrong, right? So this is very dangerous and therefore one has to be very careful. That's my, that's my conclusion. Uh, you will see that I have a set of references, but many of these references is really for, um, I try to teach myself. So, therefore, you don't have to read necessarily of these references, but uh, later on when you learn, want to come back and, um, uh, you know, learn, want to get more details for something or another, you'll find them handy. 
So let's see uh, whether you can uh, quickly answer. We have just a minute or two left. Uh, take a quick look and uh, see whether uh, whether these questions are clear to you. Uh, for example, why do people use normal, log normal and variable distribution when they do not know the exact physical distribution? It's because that's what <laughs> that's what we know and what we learn in undergraduate years that that's how we should do things so we don't ask questions, right? Too many questions is not good. What is the problem of using empirical distribution? Extrapolation problems, right? We just saw that extrapolation can be dangerous. If you must choose a dis empirical distribution, what should be your criteria? Now, this is very important that we'll get into in the next week. Smaller is the number of parameters that gives you um, a reasonable fit. And uh, we'll ask this question what reasonable means. That should be your criteria. If you can fit something with one parameter, you should not fit it with two. If you can fit it with two, you should not go with three. Because the more you fit, this is the problem of overfitting, chances are that your extrapolation would be very sensitive to small parameters. Let's say you want to fit it by straight line. Some you have some data. If you put a cube, it will cubic, it will always fit better. It will mean error will be smaller. But the third coefficient will be very small. And a small change in that error will completely make the extrapolation in the wrong direction. So it's a very bad idea to that way. Uh, then there are these other questions and um, uh, the questions are, some of these are a little bit advanced. How would you get the failure rates? I mean, you can easily calculate. calculate Although it doesn't, it's a size, sample size dependent, but you can nonetheless, for a given sample, you can calculate the number.